All right, welcome back. So we're moving on to gender equity. And the first part of this talk is a lot of history, um, but I think it helps set up why Title IX was passed in the early 1970s. There's obviously a lot of historical context that goes into that. Um, obviously law doesn't occur in a vacuum. There's a reason that laws are passed and a reason that they're passed during a certain period of time. So I wanna set that up a little bit before we actually get into Title IX and, and the three-prong test and all of that kind of stuff. So to set us up for that, I have a little historical quiz for you. So when was, and the first question is, the first Olympic marathon run at the now standard distance of 26.2 miles run by men? So when did men first run the 26.2 mile marathon? And the answer to that is at the London Games in 1908. Um, that distance happens to be the distance from Windsor Castle to where the Olympic Stadium was at the time. And then the additional 0.2 miles accounts for a partial lap around the track once the runners entered the stadium so that they would finish underneath the Royal Box. So the marathon was first introduced at the 1896 games, which are the first games of the modern Olympics. And it was essentially just a, a long race. Um, and so what became the now standard distance owes to uh, essentially the geographical layout of London in the early 1900s. So if the men first ran a 26.2 mile marathon in 1908, when was the first time it was run by women at that distance? And the answer is much, much later at the Los Angeles Games in 1984. And the winner of that first marathon at the Olympic distance was a woman named Joni Benoit, or Joan Benoit. And that's her picture there winning the marathon in LA in 1984. All right, when was weightlifting introduced as an Olympic sport for men? And the answer to that is 1896 at the uh, first of the modern Olympic Games in Athens. So then when was it introduced for women as an event to be competed in at the Olympics? And the answer to that question is at the Sydney Games in 2000. So more than 100 years later before women were allowed to compete in Olympic weightlifting. All right. Sticking with the theme of resistance training, when was the first Mr. America crowned in bodybuilding? And the answer is Bert Goodrich in 1939. And there's a picture of Bert there. Um, so the, one of the things I would call your attention to with that picture is uh, how different he looks from the modern bodybuilders. Um, and of course, part of that is due to the advent of anabolic steroids in 1958. Um, certainly there's some differences there, um, but also just um, lifelong training and changes in nutrition and differences in, um, so obviously Bert at that time, so in the late 1930s, there were some exercise machines around, but not very many. So basically that's all barbell, dumbbell, and kettlebell training there. Um, so with that aside, uh, when was the first Ms. America crowned in bodybuilding? And the answer is 1980. And that's, uh, her name was Laura Combs or is Laura Combs. And so that's a picture of her there after winning the 1980 Ms. America crown. All right. So on to, uh, other sports. So when was the first basketball game played by men? Some of you probably know this answer because you're basketball fans. But the answer to that question is 1891. So in that first iteration of the game, it was uh, somewhat similar to um, Ultimate Frisbee, where there wasn't dribbling allowed. So the first five on five game was in 1896. And then dribbling wasn't allowed until 1897. So the women picked up basketball pretty soon thereafter, but the question I have for you is, how do you think their game was different? Because it was. And the answer to that question is initially, the court had three zones. So basically um, there was a back court, a mid court, and a front court. And so each team had six players on it. And so you had two players per zone and they couldn't leave their zone. Um, so you'd have uh, two women on your team on defense in the back court two in the front court that were on offense and then two that were in the middle which seems like it would be the worst of all the positions that would basically they kind of would just relay the ball so they would pass it um, hopefully up to the front court or try to stop it from getting back into their back court so that gets changed to two zones in 1936 so then you just have front court back court and you have obviously then three players in each zone in addition to that, so I mentioned six players per team, and so this is a picture from the 1950s, so you can see the uniforms are different, but one of the things I would call your attention to, if you look, and I'll pull my pointer up here, 
if you look back here in the backcourt, so these are some of the women that are the backcourt players, and so they're just kind of hanging out waiting for the ball to cross half court. And obviously the uniforms are quite a bit different at that time as well. So in addition to six players per team, there we go. So each uh, player only got between one and three dribbles, and obviously you couldn't leave your zone. So you couldn't just run around dribbling it a bunch. You only got as many as three dribbles, and then you had to pass it or shoot it. When were women first allowed the unlimited dribble? And the answer is 1966. So men had been um, dribbling in unlimited fashion since 1897, and women aren't allowed to do so until 1966. Similarly, when was the last sanctioned six-on-six half-court basketball game held for female players? And the answer is 1995 in the state of Oklahoma. So that was the last uh, high school basketball game in which um, girls, because we're talking about younger than 18, in which girls played six on six and were restricted to half court, which from my standpoint uh, is surprisingly recent. So almost, almost 2000, um, or almost up until 2000, girls were having to play that restricted kind of a game of half court basketball. And so, that leads to the question of why. So why are all why are there all these special rules for for women playing basketball? They can't play the same way as men. Why are women not allowed to run the Olympic marathon until nearly a hundred years after the men? Why are they not allowed to compete in Olympic weightlifting until over a hundred years after the men? So why those differences? And effectively, there are uh, two prongs to that answer. I mean, you could you could have a really multifaceted answer, but the 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 easiest way to conceptualize it, I think, are effectively that there are two prongs. So part of it was that there was this misunderstanding of physiology, especially in the 1800s. So the understanding of physiology in the 1800s, at least the, the most popular conception of it, was that the body um, was, was essentially um, constrained by the first law of thermodynamics. So um, there's this idea that if if blood went to any one part of the body, then other parts of the body were being deprived of nutrients, which is kind of how blood shunting works. So they were they were kind of on the right track. But this idea then means that, so for example, that idea was used to advise people not to lift weights because there was a thought that if you lift weights and you get a lot bigger, you add additional muscle mass, well, now you're gonna have to direct blood flow to that new muscle mass that you've added, and if blood, more blood's going to the muscles, well, it's not going everywhere else. And so one of the places it's not going, in that view, is to the brain. And so that's part of the rationale that lifting weights would actually not, would, would make you dumber, basically, um, or that dumb people lifted weights was because they were depriving their, their brain of oxygen and nutrients because of that additional tissue. So from the standpoint of women, so your woman under 50, give or take, um, is going to have a monthly cycle, right? And so with that, you obviously get some blood losses. So if you've already got monthly blood losses, well, that's already in the view of uh, physicians in the 1800s, that is already a stress on the body because there's this constant regular loss of blood. And so in the late 1800s, you also see this big influx of women into colleges and universities. And so if you're in college, you're gonna to have to do a lot of what was referred to as brain work. And so if you're doing lots of brain work, you're directing a lot of blood flow to the brain. And so in the view of many physicians in the late 1800s, there's this idea that, okay, so you've got women going to college, so their brain is using up a tremendous amount of energy, a tremendous amount of blood, plus they've got this constant strain of the menstrual cycle. And so if we add really high intensity athletics on top of that, then that might just be too much strain and women would fall to pieces. They couldn't handle all that stress of being um, really intellectual and going to class and learning things and then being a high level athlete and then also having their, their mon monthly cycle. That was just too much. And so in order to protect women because they're frail, um, we need to not allow them to participate in high intensity competition. So there was that was kind of the medical strain. And that continues into the early 1900s, this idea that, that women um, just aren't up to the physical strain of sports, that if we allow them to participate as intensely as men, they're gonna get hurt because they're just, they're not built for it. It's not, it's not natural in that view. So there is that constraint placed by the medical community, again, based on a flawed understanding of physiology in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And then the other thing is, is the social constraint. So the reason that sports are 
um, part of school curriculum is that sports are supposed to teach things that we can't necessarily learn in the classroom. So sports teach us about things like resilience, toughness, aggression, um, they teach about dedication to hard work, all of those things, teamwork, sac self-sacrifice, all those sort of things. Um, that's the reason that sports are part of the curriculum in schools. But especially in the 1800s where you see um, sports really starting to become part of the curriculum, the reason that they're included there, you gotta, th you gotta realize that at that time, um, especially elite schools like in, in Britain and then in the Eastern US, those are mostly male schools. And so the rationale for including sports then is to teach all of those things, but effectively what they're trying to do is teach qualities that are associated with manliness. So things like aggression, toughness, those are, those are male qualities. So we include sports to teach boys how to become men. And so if we allow girls to play sports in the same way, well, it would stand to reason that girls would develop those same qualities, that they would develop aggression, toughness, all that kind of stuff. And so sports then, in this view, would have a masculinizing effect on women. They'd, they'd cause women to behave more like men, and so obviously that's something socially that wouldn't be wanted. And so that was kind of one of the other arguments is we don't want to let women play the same way as men because then by doing that, they're going to become more like men. And so we don't want that. And so there was this belief that a, a real woman who was truly feminine couldn't be successful in sports because she wouldn't be able to have those qualities. And then the flip side of that is if a woman was successful in sports, that she couldn't be a real woman. And so there were... There were um, I want to say safeguards, but there's probably a better word for this. Um, but there were there were rules put in place to ensure that only real women, quote unquote, were able to participate in especially high level athletics. So again, the modern Olympic Games started in 1896, but the founder of those games, whose name was uh, Baron Pierre de Coubertin, a uh, French guy, he did not want women to be allowed to compete. And initially in the Olympic Games, they weren't. Um, he said something to the effect of, and I don't have the quote in front of me, but something to the effect of the place of a woman at the games is to be in the stands cheering for men. Um, it was a, it was a much more entertaining quote than that, but that's the gist of it. Um, so by the 1936 games, women are, are being allowed to compete. And in fact, um, they were allowed to compete in shorter sprints and some of the field events a little bit earlier than that. Um, but at the 1936 games, um, sex testing was put in place where in order to compete, athletes had to go before a physician and have be physically inspected um, in order to confirm that they were a real woman, quote unquote, in order to be allowed to compete. So you get all of these restrictions on how women compete because there are these concerns that they're you know, there's this, this flawed physiological understanding that they, they can't withstand the physical strain. There's this this social aspect of it that we don't want women to become like men and so if we let them play sports like men that's going to happen um, and in fact in physical education programs particularly in the early and middle 20th century um, there was a lot of concern among female physical educators because you you had two separate departments you had the men's physical education side of things and the women's physical education side of things so there's two separate departments and so on the women's side, they were always concerned that they were going to be considered uh, developers of lesbians. Um, because again, this idea that if you're really into sports and you're a woman, well, then you're not entirely a woman. Um, and so at the University of Wisconsin, for example, they kept stats on marriage uh, into the 1940s to, to show that their graduates weren't lesbians, that they were able to uh, go out there and attract a man, if you or attract a man, if you will. Um, and so that um, they were still doing socially acceptable things is effectively why they kept marriage statistics into the 1940s. Um, so another important differentiator between men and women, and this is a, a, one of the quiz questions, is that um, in, on the male side of things, so you get professional coaches in men's sports. The first professional coach in men's sports uh, was in 1960, or sorry, not, not 19, 1864 in rowing. Um, it's a guy by the name of William Wood who uh, coached the Yale rowing team, but also kind of served as their strength and conditioning coach. So if you have a professional coach then, as opposed to just a student who's, who is you know helping his teammates and sort of coordinating all the activities, somebody who is paid to be a coach is also thereby paid to win. And so you know if a coach doesn't win, then the coach ends up getting fired and getting replaced. So 
there was this concern that male sports were too dedicated to winning, and because they're too dedicated to winning, and by saying this concern, I mean from on the part of physical educators, um, especially female physical educators, that on the men's side of things, the main goal was to win, and so because the main goal is to win, they're doing all of these things that are um, effectively against the rules. So they're recruiting athletes, which they weren't supposed to do. You get uh, direct payments of athletes, certainly by 1900. Um, you get athletes on the male side who transfer for one game and then transfer back to their old school. And so the women wanted to avoid that. And so female physical educators intentionally kept uh, competition constrained, limited the, the intensity of competition for their female athletes to try to avoid that professionalization. They thought it was, it was bad for sport and it made sport not educational. Um, it wasn't physical education anymore. It was then entirely about women. So indeed, the, the women, the, the female physical educators who ran women's sports intentionally kept competition um, sort of tamped down. They constrained competition. And that can be seen actually in some of the physical structures. So I've written about this in um, an article that's going to come out in Strength and Conditioning Journal here this year. Um, but you see that. So, for example, at the University of Texas, they still have their women's gym uh, still exists. And so in the women's gym, it's where uh, they have dance classes, because I took ballroom dance as a PE elective. Um, and so uh, in that gym, they have the old basketball courts that the women used. And so the way that that facility was designed was such that the end lines of the basketball court were about three feet, maybe less, from the wall of the gym. And they weren't standard size. And so because they weren't standard size, you couldn't host competitions in those gyms. And because the wall was really close to the inline, nobody was going to go, you know, diving out of bounds for a ball. And so it, it sort of acted as a physical constraint on the competition. And the same thing, the pool isn't there anymore, but the old women's pool that was part of that gym complex um, had really weird dimensions. Uh, it was too short and too wide, and so they couldn't use it for competition either. And so you get this, uh, and that facility was designed by the woman that it's named after, a woman named Anna Hiss, who is the director of physical education for um, for women at UT for decades, I think 40 years. Um, and so she intentionally designed that facility so that they couldn't have competitions there. So you see uh, a buying in on the part of the, of the female physical educators. One, because they're concerned about the... Um, the physiology, they're concerned about not injuring their students because they, you know, they're versed in the medical literature of the time. And then also, um, they're concerned about the femininity of their students. And so because you couldn't have, you know, competitions to the same extent like you could or like there were with the men, you see things like this picture here. Um, and so this picture is from a sports day. And so what they would do is, is kind of like intramural competition where the schools would compete against each other. Um, but they would do different things to tamp down the competition. They wouldn't keep score. Um, they'd have tea parties as part of it, that kind of thing. Something else that they would do is to have, rather than a sports day, you have a play day. And so where you've got those two colleges against each other in different uniforms, in a play day, you'd actually mix those two teams up. And so they would play each other in volleyball or basketball or something. And since you were mixed up with people from the other school, you obviously wouldn't compete as hard, or you probably wouldn't compete as hard because you're competing with people you don't know. Um, as opposed to if these are your teammates that you live with, you see them every day, you know, there's more of that you want to compete for them and with them, as opposed to if you're just mixed in with a group of random people from another college, you're probably not going to compete quite as hard. So another of the early quiz questions relates to when did elite women's sports develop in the United States? And the answer to that question is really, I mean, you have some elite women's athletes like Babe Didrikson and, and some others, um, and Maya Rudolph, several others um, prior to the 1970s. And you certainly had um, things like women's baseball during World War II, but you don't really see the rise of hyper-competitive elite women's sports until you know the 1970s and later. Um, part of that's a push from the Cold War. Effectively, we started um, getting trounced by the Russians, and in particular, we got trounced by the Russians on the women's side. And so you, there starts to be this push to, we need to sort of abandon those constraints on women's sports and we need to allow women to compete and train at a higher level so that we don't get embarrassed at the Olympics. Um, so the Cold War certainly helped push for more egalitarian environment in women's sports. All right, so that said, there was still a lot of hesitance to allow girls and women to play at a higher level even into the 1970s. 
So there's, there were some lawsuits against high school athletic associations to uh, allow women to play the same type of basketball that the boys did. So to be able to play full court five on five basketball, there were lawsuits um, to allow women to do that. And so in terms of arguments made in court about why girls shouldn't be able to play by the same rules as boys, you can see one there from a lawsuit in Tennessee. The high school coach, uh, James Smitty, said, quote, the split court game is the prettiest thing about girls basketball, end quote. And he went on to say that the game would be less interesting and exciting if the girls played full court. Well, if that's true, if, if the half court brand of the game is the more exciting brand of the game, then why is it that the boys don't play half court? So obviously there's some, some disingenuousness about that argument. From Iowa, um, so an administrator of the Iowa Girls Athletic Union, Wayne Cooley, said, quote, My young ladies aren't strong enough to play by the standard rules. Besides, watching girls play in this way isn't threatening to male spectators. It's amusing. And so there's this notion then, again, this persistent notion that girls aren't up to the physical strain, that they can't stand the intensity of the game. And so because of that, we have to protect them. And we can't allow them to play by the same rules as the boys. But one of the problems with that is that's overly broad. That basically says that all girls are uh, frail, effectively, and no boys are, right? And so we all know that that's not true, that you've got some boys who are uh, not the most athletically gifted, don't really have very good endurance, don't really have very good strength. And then by the same token, certainly there are some frail young women but at the same time, there are some other young women that are, you know, really athletic, really strong, really good endurance, all of those kinds of things. So just making that classification and saying that all girls are frail, can't withstand the strain, and so no girls can play five on five, that's, that's entirely too broad from the standpoint of the law. And so if your concern is safety, one of the things that you would need to do is to differentiate out who is able to withstand the strain of the game and who is not. And so if your your goal is to protect people who are not up to, who don't have the physical capacity, you've got to have some other way of doing it than simply basing it entirely on gender. So this particular guy, uh, Wayne Cooley, went on to argue that allowing girls to play by the same rules as boys would diminish the game because they would play it badly, effectively, that it would offend the audience. And so he, he argued that girls can't play five-on-five -five basketball like boys do, and so you know that was just going to be uh, terrible to watch, and so we shouldn't allow that. Baseball was similarly hesitant to let girls play, especially Little League baseball. Little League did everything they could. Um, into the 1970s to keep girls from playing baseball. They tried to classify it as a contact sport. We'll talk about why that's important here in a little bit. Um, so, but before we get to arguments made in a case with Little League Baseball, I have a fun fact for you. And that fun fact is that in 1931, a young woman named Jackie Mitchell, who at the time was 17 years old, signed a minor league contract to play professional baseball. And so since she's playing minor league pro ball, um, her, the team that she played for played in an exhibition game against the New York Yankees. And so Jackie Mitchell got to pitch against the entire Yankees lineup. And in the course of doing that, she struck out both Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig in a 1931 exhibition game. Now, pretty impressive, right? 17-year-old uh, female pitcher striking out two of the most legendary uh, figures in professional baseball. Now, after that happened, the baseball commissioner, whose name was uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, actual name, um, voided Jackie's contract or Mitchell's contract um, because he said, quote, the game would be too strenuous for a woman, end quote. And so that was her only professional game that I'm aware of. All right. So as it pertains to Little League Baseball, so again, this is a court case from the early 1970s, the, the contention of Little League Baseball as an organization was that um, baseball was, similar, similarly to what Landis said, baseball was too strenuous for girls to play, that they would get hurt because of it. And so they brought in an expert witness who is an orthopedist at Brown University, and during his testimony, he made several contentions that you can see there. One is that girls can't throw overhand, so, you know, you've got the expression throwing like a girl, which um, is that very characteristic tricep throw as opposed to like good external rotation of the shoulder. And of course, we know now that that 
quote unquote, throwing like a girl is really throwing like someone who is inexperienced because if you throw with your non-dominant hand, the odds are pretty good you're gonna do that characteristic you know, tricep push throw um, as opposed to that normal overhand throwing motion that you probably do on your dominant side. Um, but anyway, he, he went ahead and, and thought that girls were physically, well, he went ahead and testified that girls were physically incapable of throwing in the same manner as boys, so girls can't throw overhand. Um, that their bones are weak, effectively, and so they're more likely to be damaged by exercise, that their pelvises made their gait unstable, and then the last thing, or the last quote there is, uh, again, this is from that orthopedist, is, it is, quote, the normal activity of a young lady to keep off of baseball fields and to play with dolls, end quote. So, um, also in that lawsuit, um, Little League Baseball an official from Little League Baseball expressed concern that the league could get sued if uh, girls got breast cancer from getting tagged out on the boobs, which is um, impressive on two fronts. One, that he said boobs in court, and two, <laughs> that he uh, that there's such a fundamental misunderstanding of how cancer works. And then one of the other things that Little League Baseball officials said is, well, we can't possibly congratulate girls because obviously if a boy makes a good play, you pat him on the butt. But if we do that with girls, then that's going to cause a problem, right? That's going to look bad. We can't, we can't do that. So how do we congratulate them? Uh, and they, made, they had similar questions or made similar arguments about uh, if a girl gets injured. So if a girl suffers a thigh injury, how could they possibly um, have a coach look at that or treat that? That would be something that would be socially unacceptable. And so we can't allow girls to play because it would be uh, uncomfortable and violate social norms for everybody. And so those things haven't entirely gone away. So certainly we've made um, exceptional gains in achieving equality since Title IX and passed in the early 1970s. Um, but you still see some strains of that idea that, that women are um, physically incapable of withstanding high level uh, stresses that we see in elite sports. So w back when I was at Concordia, and so there's a picture of a Concordia basketball player there in the lower right. Um, I don't know her, um, but anyway, that's a that's the Concordia basketball team. But the one of the athletes that I, I did know fairly well, who was one of our athletic training students, um, came to me one day after class, and she was in an, an athletic training class with me and said, "Hey, uh, you know, should I should I play today?" Or the quote that I have up there, "Coach, should I play today?" Because for whatever reason, she always called me coach, which killed me. Um, but nonetheless, she wanted to know if she should play today. And I said, well, you know, do you have practice today? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, you should, you should probably go. <laughs> and so she said, well, I don't know if I should, though, because I'm on my period. And I was like, okay. Because uh, I had no idea what she was talking about. But she had, she had read uh, a news story that said that um, girl, well, female athletes were more likely to tear their ACL during a certain part of their menstrual cycle um, and so she interpreted that to mean that while she was menstruating, that she should not go to practice because she was more likely to tear her ACL. And so, like I said, I hadn't been familiar with that, so I looked into the, the research on that. And there's a, there are tons of problems with that research in terms of how they define the menstrual cycle, how they measure it, um, when they've, during which period uh, or which part of the cycle they have found uh, increased likelihood of women tearing their ACLs. So um, that idea that it's related to the menstrual cycle, I think, is a vestige of the old ideas um, you know, from the, the 1800s that this idea of, of uh, female frailty that's associated with their, their menstrual cycle. Certainly, that is not to say that, that girls and women don't tear their ACLs at a higher rate than boys playing the same sports, because there's a ton of evidence that they do. So if you're looking at sports like basketball and soccer, the incidence of ACL injury to uh, female athletes as opposed to male athletes, it's about twice as high, but it's probably not due to the menstrual cycle. It's probably due to um, bony alignment, so a wider pelvis, so you get a, a steeper angle at the knee, so more um, it pulls the tibia away from the femur, so you get steeper angulation. That inherently stresses the ACL, but also things related to muscular strength and sports specialization. Um, women and girl athletes are less likely to lift weights. When they do, they're less likely to lift um, at the same relative intensity. Um, if you only play sports and you don't do strength and conditioning activities, then you end up with um, pretty significant muscle imbalances. So particularly as it relates to soccer and basketball, quad dominance, um, which puts extra stress on the ACL. So girls and women do suffer ACL injuries at a higher rate than boys and men, 
but it's probably related to a host of other factors, not to the menstrual cycle or any sort of inherent female frailty. And there's a similar thing. Um, there were some headlines a little while back about concussions in female athletes. Same kind of thing. Girls and women do, do suffer concussions at a higher rate than boys and men playing the same sports. So again, sports like soccer and basketball. Um, but that probably has to do with things like, uh, in the case of soccer, so the soccer ball is the same size for boys and girls. Girls tend to be smaller, have a smaller head. And so if a, a female athlete is heading the, the soccer ball that is relatively larger compared to her head size, she's gonna get a faster head acceleration. She's more likely to get a concussion. Um, again, strength and conditioning could play a role in that. If, if girls and women aren't doing as much uh, lifting, particularly like strengthening of the traps, strengthening of the neck musculature, you get faster head accelerations, they're more likely to get injured. And then some of it too is probably reporting. Uh, girls and women are, are more likely to report head injuries than boys are. Um, so there's that as well. So you, you still see some of this idea of menstrual cycle and injuries in girls and women, um, but I really don't think that there's anything there. All right, so back to the law. So um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, so you can see what Title VI of that Civil Rights Act says that, quote, no person shall, on the ground of race, be excluded from, denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And why that's important is that establishes this precedent of the federal government saying you can't discriminate, in this case, on the basis of race, and if you do, then you're going to lose your funding from the federal government. So um, that then is this idea of the power of the purse. So we're going to withhold your funding if you choose to engage in discrimination based on race to try to, so that's the federal government's way to try to coerce people to stop doing that. And that idea comes up again in Title IX. So Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 says, quote, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So the idea there, similar idea, that if you discriminate on the basis of sex, if you deny women the opportunity to gain education, deny them the same opportunity that you would allow to boys and men, then you're going to lose your federal funding. So again, the federal government is exerting the power of the purse, trying to sort of coerce uh, groups into not discriminating on the basis of sex. So one of the things there, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, is there's no definition of an educational program. So what is an educational program? Is it just what we do in the classroom? Does it include sports? Uh, if so, how? So there's a lot that was kind of uh, ambiguous from the original law in 1972. So one of the things after Title IX is you see a huge jump in the number of athletes. So in 1972, right before Title IX is passed, there are less than 30,000 female intercollegiate athletes. So there are very, very few. And then shortly after Title IX is passed in 19, so Title IX is passed in 1972. So by 1976, the number of female athletes at the collegiate level has uh, more than doubled. So in the 1976-1977 school year, the number of female intercollegiate athletes is up from 30,000 to 62,000. In 2012, that number jumps again or has jumped again to more than 200,000 female athletes at the collegiate level. So Title IX has led to a dramatic increase in the number of opportunities for girls and women to participate both at the high school level and college level. Um, so that's that's been good. Um, so you can see there, these are the latest uh, data I was able to find in terms of participation statistics. So in the 17-18 school year, 3.4 million girls participated in interscholastic athletics out of a total of 12.3 million students. So that's a 28% participation rate, but that 3.4 million is up from only 300,000 in 1972, so a huge increase. On the boys' side, so again, 17-18 school year, 4.5 million boys participated out of 12.7 million students, so 35% participation, so a little bit higher for boys. And again, up from 3.6 million in 1972. So uh, the number of athletic participation opportunities for both um, boys and girls has increased, although obviously more substantially for girls than for boys. 
At the college level, women make up 57% of undergraduate students, but are only 43% of college athletes. So the argument uh, among many is that women are still underrepresented at the college level, that if almost 60% of your student body is females, then there should be some proportionality that should be similar in terms of the proportion of your college athletes. So um, one of the things that, that really guides us in terms of Title IX's application now is the Office of Civil Rights, that's what OCR stands for, the Office of Civil Rights 1979 Interpretation of the Law. So there are three areas, and then the, the third area has three prongs that we'll talk about here in a second, where they looked at uh, and, and they provided guidance on how schools should carry this law out. So the first one is that financial assistance has to be quote unquote, substantially proportional. So that obviously leaves a lot of wiggle room. So an important thing there is that the scholarships don't have to be exactly equal, just awarded on a substantially, substantially proportional basis. So the Office of Civil Rights leaves room for non-discriminatory yeah, non factors that could explain disparities. So as an example, uh, one team may have more out-of-state participants. So if you've got like a tennis team who, um, you know, the, the men's tennis team, I'm speaking here about the college level, the men's tennis team um, gets more in scholarship than the women's tennis team. Maybe the reason for that is because of discriminatory reasons, or it could be that, that on the men's side of things, they have more out-of-state athletes. And as you know, uh, out-of-state tuition is higher. And so the, the waivers that they're given, those, those tuition waivers, the scholarships, the, the dollar value is higher for the men than the women. Um, but if, if that's the reason, that is because the men have more out-of-state athletes than the women's team does, well, that's not a discriminatory reason. They're not, the women don't have less money because of their sex. It just happens that the way that uh, the breakdown happened there in terms of where the athletes are from affected their financial assistance. So you also have to look at equality in other program areas. So that includes things like your facilities. So are the women's facilities similar to the men or do the men have a lot nicer locker rooms? Do the men have a lot nicer weight room? Those kinds of things, um, as well as equipment. So again, same kind of thing. Do the, do the men get all Nike and Under Armour and the women get, I don't know, BCG, Spalding, whatever. Um, that may not, you know, that's, that's a difference there in terms of expenditures. Um, Equality in terms of coaching, that includes the number of and then the qualifications of. Uh, practice times, hopefully the, the female athletes don't always get the terrible practice times. Um, things like publicity, how you promote the teams. Um, equality in the number of tutors, the hour, hours of tutoring available, the housing. You know, Are your men's teams all in the good new dorms and your women's teams are all in the dorms from the 1930s? Um, dining, travel funds, etc. So are you comparable in each of those services? Or does one, again, the men, do the men get much nicer stuff than the women? Do they have better facilities? Are they allowed to uh, stay in hotels the night before games? Those kinds of things. So um, comparable services in terms of equality in all those other program areas. And then the big one that has spurred the most lawsuits is the accommodation of interests and abilities. And so, there is a three-part test there that is associated with interests and abilities. And so the first one is that the opportunities are substantially proportionate to the school's enrollment. This one's referred to as the safe harbor clause. So 50% of your students are female and 50% of your athletes are female, then you're all set. Um, and so this is the one where uh, that's also, it's the easiest for schools to meet um, in terms of providing opportunities that are proportionate to enrollment, but it's also the one that has sort of stirred up the most controversy because one of the ways, if you've got um, over-representation on the male side, so if you know your student body is 57% female, but your athletic department is, I don't know, 55% male, one of the ways that you can get your athletes more in accordance with your student population is to simply cut the number of male teams. And so by doing that, you change the proportions. You, you um, by reducing the number of male athletes, 
bring up the percentage uh, by, by decreasing the total number, you've increased the proportion of female athletes in your department. So that's um, what schools often do because while it would be great to add female sports in order to meet that proportionality requirement, a lot of athletic departments aren't profitable. And so because of that, it's, it's um, makes more sense financially to oftentimes to cut male sports than it does to add female sports. So the first one there is opportunities proportionate to school enrollment. The second one there, a history and continuing practice of program expansion responsive to the interests and abilities of the underrepresented sex. So the short version of that one, the way it's typically referred to is history and continuing practice. Um, only one institution has successfully satisfied this prong. In 1992, Syracuse was accused of violating Title IX due to insufficient offerings for female athletes. The university had plans in place to promote three women's sports to varsity teams in the near future. And because of that, the court concluded that although the requirements of Title IX were not met at that time, the fact that the university had a plan in place and was acting on it to um, expand women's sports put them in compliance. So only one school, again, Syracuse from 1992, has managed to satisfy that prong. And then the last one there is a demonstration that interests and abilities have been fully and effectively accommodated. So in order to do that, you would have to, as a, as a school, survey the students and make sure that you have met their interests and abilities. So um, one school that famously used this or attempted to use this prong unsuccessfully was Louisiana State University, LSU, in 2000. And so in Peterson versus LSU in 2000, Female student athletes sued, alleging that the university had denied them equal opportunity to compete for athletic scholarships and thus denied them equal access to benefits and services. Females made up 49% of the student body, but only 29% of the athletes. LSU argued that women were just not as interested in sports. The court found that LSU did not have proportionate opportunities, had no history of expansion, and did not accommodate the interest and ability of athletes. The court went on to say, quote, if an institution makes a decision not to provide equal athletic opportunities for its female students because of paternalism and stereotypical assumptions about their interests and abilities, that institution intended to treat women differently because of their sex, end quote. Therefore, the discrimination was intentional. Um, so what you've got there, so if you're going to say, so effectively what LSU did was they said, well, yeah, only about a third of our athletes are, are women, but that's because women just aren't as interested in sports, um, which again is, is a sexist assumption and might have been true, but they actually hadn't done any sort of surveying of the student body to show that that was in fact the case. And so because of that, really all LSU was doing was making a sexist assumption and had no data to back that up. And so of course, because of that, they were unsuccessful in that suit. All right, so one of the key problems with Title IX is this idea of a programmatic versus an institutional approach. So Title IX says that if you are um, a, an institution, so if you are an organization, we'll use that wording, that receives federal funding and you discriminate on the basis of sex, well, then you can lose that federal funding. But from a programmatic or institutional approach standpoint, what that means then is, or what that could mean is, does that apply to a specific program that receives federal funding, or does that apply to the entire institution? Um, so where this works out or how, how this works out is that the athletic department doesn't directly receive federal funding. Now the students in the athletic department do, so many of them are on um, you know, Pell Grants or um, federal student loans, those kinds of things, if they're not on a full scholarship, which is most of your athletes, um, so many of your athletes then are receiving some kind of, of federal financial assistance. So if you take a programmatic approach, what you would say is, well, the athletic department, that program doesn't receive federal funding directly. So title IX doesn't apply to it. If you take the institutional approach, that would say that because the institution, because the university receives some federal funding, then every part of the university has to be in compliance with Title IX. So in several cases in the 1970s and early 1980s, um, the courts took a programmatic approach. And so those include um, 
Oakland versus Ann Arbor, Bennett versus West Texas State, Hillsdale College versus the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and several others. So you got several cases where the court takes a programmatic approach where they say that the specific program has to receive money from the federal government directly. And if that program doesn't, then that program doesn't have to meet Title IX. So the athletic department then wouldn't have to be in compliance with Title IX because, again, they don't get funding directly. However, in another case, Hafner versus Temple, the court took an institutional approach. And so they said if any part of the, of the university receives federal money, then all of the university has to be in compliance with Title IX. So that eventually reaches the Supreme Court. In this case, Grove City College versus Bell in 1984. And so in that case, um, so Grove City College is a private liberal arts college in western Pennsylvania. It's about an hour north of Pittsburgh. And so they refused to execute what was called an assurance of compliance order to demonstrate that they were in compliance with Title IX. And so because they, they weren't showing compliance with Title IX, the Department of Education began proceedings against them to declare all of their students ineligible to receive federal funding. So the Supreme Court ruled that the language of Title IX made it program specific and that only programs receiving direct funding were subject to Title IX. So the Supreme Court, in this case, took a programmatic approach. So if, um, so essentially then, Title IX wouldn't apply to the athletic department because they didn't receive direct funding. So in response to that, Congress passed the Civil Rights Restoration Act of 1987. And so um, that took an institutional approach. So Congress then said, no, what we really meant for the original piece of legislation for Title IX from, from 1972 to say was that if any part of the institution receives federal funding, then the entire institution has to be in compliance with Title IX. And so that has been the way things have operated since the late 1980s. So an important case um, from the early, 90, early 90s is uh, Franklin versus Gwinnett County. And so the story there is that there's a, a high school student whose name was Christine Franklin, and she was harassed by a coach who was also her teacher. And so that coach would ask her about her sex life, ask whether she would sleep with older men, and then forcibly kissed her in the school parking lot. Franklin complained to the principal of the school. The school investigated the coach but did not dismiss that coach, so didn't fire him, and discouraged her from pressing charges until the coach resigned at the end of the year. Effectively, the principal said, look, you know, I know he's doing all these things, but he's not, he's going to retire at the end of the year, um, so just don't do anything. He'll be, he'll be gone by the end of the year. Don't worry about it. So in response to the school effectively ignoring what was happening to her, Franklin complained to the Office of Civil Rights, which agreed to let the school pursue its own grievance procedure um, and obviously didn't alleviate the problem. So then Franklin sued, and the Supreme Court found that Title IX places a duty on schools to stop teachers and coaches from discriminating against students um, in any school activities, and that sexual harassment, which is what that coach was doing, uh, is a form of discrimination and is therefore covered. And the important thing there is that um, the court found that money was a remedy. So because she suffered um, because of this discrimination, that the school could be liable, could have to pay her money in damages. So um, think, you know, emotional distress, uh, yeah, intentional infliction of emotional distress, those kinds of things, um, that the school could be liable for those if there was deliberate indifference. And so deliberate indifference means that the um, school in that case knew about it and then chose not to act. So they, they just didn't do anything. That's deliberate indifference. They were aware of it, didn't act on it. Um, and so with that, now violations of Title IX, if the school knows about those violations and doesn't fix them or doesn't even attempt to fix them, um, then the people who've been damaged by that can get money from it. And so why that matters is you see more lawyers become interested in being involved in Title IX suits because now there's money in it for them. You can get damages. And so because of that, you start to see more and more lawsuits related to Title IX as we move into the 1990s. An important thing, so Title IX is often uh, sort of discussed as this, this watershed, this landmark movement for um, women's rights, and certainly it is, um, but an important thing is not to ignore the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause. So we talked about this um, as when we talked about 
the constitutional law chapter. So remember that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment says, quote, no state shall deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. So if you discriminate, remember there's different levels of scrutiny. So we talked about um, racial classification. So with things like uh, affirmative action, that those sort of rules that discriminate or where the government is discriminating on the basis of race must undergo a strict scrutiny um, review. And so there you've got where that classification is necessary in order to achieve a compelling government interest. And so remember that a way to conceptualize that is a compelling government interest is something that the government has to do and something that is necessary is the only way for the government to accomplish that thing that it has to do. So necessary and compelling, government has to do it, and this is the only way to accomplish that. When, we're, when the government is discriminating on the basis of gender, and so discriminating in the way I'm using it now just means to separate out, to, to separate groups. So not, I'm not using discriminating in the pejorative sense at the moment. So um, if the government is discriminating on the basis of sex or gender, which they're doing um, in the case of Title IX, what you've got is intermediate scrutiny. And so that means that the classification is substantially related to an important government interest. So an important government interest is something that the government should do, not something that the government has to do, but something that it should do. And substantially related means it's the best way to do it. Not the only way, as we get with necessary, but it's the best way to do it. So what ended up happening there is, um, so like Little League Baseball was found to be a state actor for reasons we won't get into. Um, but what they said is, well, we're, we have to keep girls from playing Little League Baseball because they're, they're simply too frail. They're going to get hurt, right? And so we're doing it for safety reasons. And so effectively, Little League Baseball was, offering, was, was arguing that the important government interest, the thing that the government should do, is protect the safety of the athletes. And so because of that, that this is the best way to do it. And so what the court said was that while protecting the safety of uh, young athletes is an important government interest, it's something that the government should do, if our concern is their safety, that they are uh, basically too weak, too frail to play, discriminating on the basis of gender is not the best way to do it. So what you could do is have some sort of physical capacity test. Maybe you got a, a mile test or you have, you know, uh, T-drills or... Um, you know, sort of agility drills, or you have like strength testing or something like that, so that if somebody doesn't pass those physical tests, then that shows that they are not conditioned enough, not strong enough, not able to withstand the rigors of training and competition, so we'll, we'll exclude them on that basis. So the court found that there was a less discriminatory means of excluding people so that we ensured the, the safety of the participants. So effectively, um, saying that all girls can't play because all girls are too frail is entirely too broad. So that's not the, the best way to achieve that important interest of safety. So the 14th Amendment was really, really big in um, allowing or, or getting females, getting girls in the door to be able to play sports. So Title IX is important, but the 14th Amendment was also very, very important in that. All right, so having said that... Um, the Franklin versus Gwinnett County case opens up damages and that there are more lawsuits at that point. So one of the important ones um, comes from 1996, which is Cohen versus Brown University. So cases after the Civil Rights Restoration Act, which remember was in 1987, have largely focused on the accommodation of interests and abilities, that third, that third uh, thing from the OCR interpretation from 79. So uh, in the case of Cohen versus Brown, uh, female student athletes brought a complaint against the university after women's gymnastics, women's volleyball, and the brown women's volleyball team is pictured there, uh, women's volleyball, men's golf, and men's water polo were dropped to club status in the spring of 1991 due to financial difficulties at the university. The female athletes complained that brown violated equal opportunity provision and that the interests and abilities of female athletes were not being accommodated by the university. So, the women also argued that Brown did not meet the first prong because female enrollment at the university on the whole was 48%. So women made up 48% of the student body, but female athletes made up only 39% of the athletic population. So Brown countered that the 60-40 split was a reflection of interest and ability to the student body, 
as you can see, they're echoing the arguments made by LSU several years later in 2000. Brown also argued that if Title IX required full and effective accommodation of the underrepresented gender, that would violate the Fifth Amendment Equal Protection Clause by putting male athletes at a disadvantage. So again, the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments both have the Equal Protection Clause in them. So in this case, um, Brown invoked the Fifth Amendment Equal Protection Clause. So the court disagreed. Um, the court found that the proportion of athletes didn't change and still 39% after the cuts, because again, they cut two female teams and two male teams. Um, and so that the, the final uh, student athlete population is still not representative of university demographics. And further, um, this was an example, not an example of effectively accommodating the interests and abilities because there had been varsity female gymnasts and volleyball players, and they obviously wanted to continue playing. So Brown was not able to meet the full accommodation test. Brown also showed no evidence that the men were more likely to engage in athletics than women, so there was no violation of the Fifth Amendment Equal Protection Clause. So the court issued an injunction reinstating varsity status of both volleyball and gymnastics. Similar case. Um, so in Kelly versus Board of Trustees, so this comes from the University of Illinois, as you can see there in 1994. So the members of the men's swimming team sued uh, the university on, on Title IX and equal protection grounds after the university eliminated the men's swimming team along with three other varsity sports. The court held that termination of the men's program was, quote, a reasonable response to the re uh, requirements of Title IX, end quote. Also, the court ruled that the university did not violate the Equal Protection Clause because gender equity was an important government objective, so something the government should do, and eliminating the men's team was substantially related to that objective. So in this case, the court ruled that that was the best way to do it, at least the best way available to Illinois at the time. So the court said, Title IX's stated objective is not to ensure that athletic opportunities are available, available for women increase. Rather, its avowed purpose is to prohibit educational institutions from discriminating on the basis of sex. And so one of the things that came out of that case is that um, ideally, schools would add women's sports, but obviously that's not always feasible. And so one of the ways then to meet Title IX is to cut men's sports. So it's not, it's not in the spirit of the law to do that, but in order to meet the actual letter of the law requirements, that's something that schools are able to do. So again, you can see there, gender equity is an important objective, and that move is substantially related, so something the government should do, and this is the best way to do it, which again, that intermediate level of scrutiny. All right, so um, in terms of separate teams, so if this sport is not a contact sport, and there is no other team available, um, then women have to be able, have to be allowed to try out for that team. So um, the question then, of course, is what is a contact sport? And so contact sports obviously include things like football and hockey. Um, and schools have tried to press to count baseball, basketball, et cetera, for that. So there is a contact sports exception for Title IX. Um, and so what schools typically do, so where that matters. So you don't have to let women try out for the football team. You can choose to do so, but you don't have to because that's a contact sport. And so there is still some sort of, there's sort of that paternalistic, like, well, women tend to be smaller and they could get hurt playing with, uh, you know, really big guys that play football. And so because that is an obvious danger, the courts have felt, then you can not allow women to try out for the, for contact teams. So that's the contact sports exception is that um, you don't have to allow women to try out for the football team. Um, so, but a result of that then is if you've got a sport like football, which has tons and tons of uh, players, so you may have you know 100 or more athletes on the football team, one of the things that Title IX provides is that you have to have substantially proportionate opportunities. So that doesn't mean the same absolute number of sports. And so since um, football has you know 100 bodies, there, are, there aren't really any similar women's sports that have so many athletes I mean, track kind of, but you usually have both men's and women's track teams, so they kind of offset each other. Um, and so oftentimes schools will have more female teams than they have male teams to account for football. 
and ensure that they have an equal number of participation opportunities. So think of, think of them as roster spots. So you have to have a similar number of roster spots for women as you do for men. So if you've got a football team that has 100 roster spots, you're probably going to have to have some extra sports like Whitewater does. So you know we have uh, women's bowling, for example, that helps make up those additional roster spots, allows additional athletic participation opportunities for women that we, um, to offset what we see on the men's side. And you also see that, so for example, when I was at, at Texas as an undergrad, um, there were signs up every fall when school would start all over campus and in the cafeterias and stuff about uh, trying to get women to come out for the rowing team. Because one of the ways that UT offsets the uh, scholarships from the football team is to have a really big rowing team. Um, and so they would try to get women to come out for the rowing team and, and offer scholarships for that. So um, one, one of the, the sort of funny things about that is you know, a lot of the women who ended up on the rowing team were just really good athletes, but none of them had rowed ever before they'd gotten to college. But it was an opportunity to, um, you know, be an athlete, to train and, and compete and all those kinds of things, um, and also earn a scholarship. And so I knew uh, several women that went out for the team and a few that, that ended up making it. And, and like I said, they were basically just really good athletes. Um, and so they were able to translate that into success on the rowing team. All right. So as mentioned, you don't have to allow women to try out for contact sports, but if you do, you can't discriminate once you've allowed them to try out. So um, that comes from the case of Heather Mercer, who was a football player at Duke. So Heather Mercer, she's pictured there in the lower right. That's her in, in her Duke gear. Um, so she was an all-state kicker in high school. I think she played soccer in high school as well. She attended Duke and walked on. She practiced with the other kickers on the team, but um, she was never allowed to practice with the full team, nor was she allowed to suit up for home games like the other walk-on kickers. So she says that when she asked the coach, or said, that when she asked the coach to suit up for games, the coach told her to go sit and watch from the stands with her boyfriend. In the spring of her freshman year, she was allowed to participate in the spring game, and she even kicked the winning field goal. After the spring game, she was told that she had made the team by the coaches for the following year. The Duke staff even told the media that Mercer had made the team. Several weeks later, so now we're into the summer, the head coach told her that she had not, in fact, made the team and she would not be allowed to practice with the team over the summer. She asked why she couldn't attend the summer practices with the team, and she says the coach asked her why she wanted to play football anyway and not be in beauty pageants instead. She was officially cut from the team that fall. So then she turned around and sued the university, saying that she'd been discriminated against uh, on the basis of her sex. And so her, the initial case uh, was dismissed by the district court, but the appeals court ruled that when title, while Title IX doesn't require uh, that schools allow females to try out for contact sports, if the school chooses to do so, which Duke did, um, the school and staff cannot then discriminate on the basis of gender. And so ultimately, Mercer was awarded $2 million in punitive damages. So you can either have separate teams, or again, if you have a contact sport, you don't have to let girls or women try out. But if you do let them try out, then you can't discriminate on the basis of their gender after that time. So as mentioned, to meet that first prong of the three-prong test, oftentimes schools will cut men's teams. So you can see Illinois swimming there in the lower right. Uh, another famous case from, comes from Miami of Ohio. So one of the primary criticisms of Title IX is that it has resulted in cutting male teams, especially at the university level. So as schools moved to come into compliance in the 80s and 90s, men's golf, baseball, swimming, and wrestling were often the victims of cuts. So this is taking a first-prong approach of trying to get to proportionality. Because most, state, most schools have a higher percentage of females enrolled than they do female athletes, they can bring the number closer to proportionality by reducing male teams. So as an example, let's say women make up 57% of your enrollment, but only 43% of your athletes, and you have 500 athletes. That makes 215 women and 285 men. If you cut teams totaling 50 men, women now make up 48% of your student athlete population. So you're closer to proportionality. And that said, it's important to remember that the Office of Civil Rights has never actually defined what proportionality entails. So does the number of female athletes have to be within 10% of the male number, 5%? It's, uh, OCR determines that on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's no really strict guidance there. There's no hard and fast number that you have to meet. So at the University of Illinois in 1993, they cut men's swimming and fencing. 
Both men's and women's swimming and diving were cut due to a budget shortfall, and even after the cuts, women comprised only 23% of the student athletes, but 44% of the student body as a whole. And so the men alleged that the cuts were a quota system, and quotas are not allowed, and same thing we talked about with affirmative action, can't use quotas there uh, either. And so in the Illinois case, the court disagreed and dismissed the complaint of the male athletes. At Miami of Ohio, which is pictured there, or their mascot is pictured there, to fit proportionality, the university cut men's tennis, wrestling, and soccer. As with Illinois, due to budget constraints, they couldn't add women's sports. In 1992, uh, or in a 1992 case at Colorado State, they cut baseball and women's softball. And the interesting th thing there is that the cuts actually decreased the difference in proportion of female athletes to student athletes um, to 10%. Uh, but the court found that the university had no history of continuing practice and had, um, whoops, hang on, <laughs> found, that the court, found that the university had no history of continuing practice um, and made them reinstate the team. So for its part, the Office of Civil Rights has said that cutting men's sports is against the spirit of the law, which was intended to ensure opportunities for all, not decreased opportunities for some. So, and I've touched on some of this before, but from an administrator's standpoint, ideally we'd be able to add teams to accommodate the interests of women, but according to a 2014 NCAA study of profitability of athletic departments, it found that all athletic departments out of outside of FBS uh, operate in the red, so outside of the highest Division I level, all of those athletic departments operate in the red. Um, of 123 Athletic departments in the FBF division, or sorry, FBS division, only 20 generated a profit. So only 20 out of 123 athletic departments in football's highest level generated a profit. So the reality then is that adding sports may not be feasible. So it should also be noted that a general accounting office or GAO report looking at the years between 1981 and 1999, so it's getting a little dated at this point, but nonetheless, it found that for most schools, increased opportunities for females did not mean lost opportunities for males. In that span, opportunities for females increased from 90,000 to 163,000, but at the same time, male opportunities increased from 220,000 to 232,000. So even though there, there are headlines at times about the cutting of male sports, the overall numbers of participants numbers of participation opportunities for both uh, genders have increased um, quite a bit. All right, so one of the things that comes up then is what is a sport? So what, what counts as a sport? And so an important thing is, uh, does something like cheerleading count? And the answer is, is no. Um, so in terms of what counts as a sport, it depends on whether the primary purpose of the athletic activity, or sorry, whether the primary purpose of the activity is athletic competition and whether the athletes are engaging in sports at the intercollegiate or inter interscholastic level of competition. So this interpretation um, presumes that cheerleading or other similar activities are not sports. The Office of Civil Rights clarified their position uh, most recently in 2008 by saying that if an athletic association like the NCAA considers it a sport that and, uh, and the school follows their requirements, so follows NCAA requirements, the Office of Civil Rights will consider it a sport. So if the NCAA considered cheerleading a sport, then the Office of Civil Rights would as well. And if cheerleading were to count, it would help substantially with proportionality. At the high school level, that would account for upwards of 220,000 new participation opportunities by including cheer and dance. And so that would be something that, that could shift that. Um, but until that happens, or unless that happens, the, the emerging sports for women include things like rowing, bowling, water polo, and ice hockey. So the criticism of those uh, emerging sports has been, like with rowing and bowling, that those are participation opportunities, but they may not necessarily be meaningful ones. They're just, because um, oftentimes, like I mentioned with rowing, the athletes that I knew, and again, this is anecdotal, but the athletes that I knew at Texas who were varsity rowers were, you know, in high school, they were power lifters, they were um, softball players, basketball players, etc. They had no interest in rowing. Um, but they were athletes who liked to compete, so they, they picked up rowing to continue competing, uh, but also then to for the opportunity to earn a scholarship. So is that really meeting the interests or abilities? And the answer is, is probably no, and there's a similar thing for bowling. Now, certainly some people are pretty competitive bowlers in high school, but, you know, how many... Is the addition of a bowling team, does that really meet the interests and abilities of athletes, or would there be sports that are better for that? 
The other criticism has been that some of these sports like ice hockey and water polo are fairly expensive, especially ice hockey. You know, you got to pay for the ice time. You got to pay for skating lessons. You don't have to pay for skating lessons, but you probably did at some point. Um, and so because of that, that those then provide opportunities for people who already are fairly high socioeconomic status. And so these emerging sports, and another one on there for women is lacrosse, um, which is also a fairly expensive sport, that those allow scholarships for uh, women who already have somewhat of an advantage because they already came from a, a higher socioeconomic status household rather than uh, people from lower socioeconomic status uh, and or minorities because most of those sports like water polo and ice hockey are also predominantly white. And so that has been the criticism of, among these emerging sports is basically that they, they don't really help people who, who need help. So, you know, one of the, the things that has been promoted about athletic scholarships is they allow people to go to college on a scholarship who may not otherwise get in. So you get athletes from, you know, football, basketball, baseball, who may be from lower economic status, lower SES households. Um, and so athletics provide a gateway to achieve an education. And so the argument against some of these emerging women's sports is that the women who, who play them at the college level would have had the opportunity to go to college anyway, and now they just have, uh, they have to pay less because they're on an athletic scholarship. So that's, that's some of the criticism that has arisen um, with these emerging sports. All right, so I mentioned that the facilities and scheduling have to be proportionate. So in terms of, you know, as an administrator, as you're setting up practice schedules, as you're setting up uh, who gets to use the gyms and when and all that stuff, things to consider um, if that case goes to court. Um, so here is the way that the court would determine whether or not you were in compliance. So the court's going to look at or they're going to compare benefits and treatments and see if they are comparable. So um, do the athletes compete during the same part of the calendar? Do they have the same quality of clothing? Uh, same opportunity to practice in facilities at the same time, substantially equal facilities, etc. Right. So one of the things to consider here is that if there's a difference in um, the facilities, the scheduling, the uniforms, etc., um, one of the things to consider as an administrator is why is that happening? Is there, is it happening because of sex or are the girls tre being treated differently or are the women being treated differently because they're girls and women or is there some sort of a, a non-discriminatory reason so it's okay if the programs the men's and women's or boys and girls programs differ for a reason that is non-discriminatory so for example maybe the women always practice late you know maybe they always have the, the eight o'clock practice spot or something that would not be considered an ideal practice time but the reason that they have that non-ideal practice time is because the coach has another job and can't get to the gym before eight o'clock or something like that or um, maybe there are some sort of association rules that require the women to play before the men so for example um, in the american southwest conference which is a division three conference that uh, Concordia, Texas, and uh, Mary Harden Baylor and several others are in. Um, the way that basketball works is that the men's and women's teams travel together and they play double headers. And so per conference scheduling rules, um, the, the women play at 530 and the men play at 730. And so if a student uh, said, well, you know, my parents can't make, can't ever make the games because they can't get there by 530 and they sued the particular university for a violation of Title IX, um, you know, or based on this idea of they always had the less than optimal schedule, they never got to play the late game, one of the things that the university would do would be to point to the uh, conference rules. And so they're playing this schedule because of conference rules, not because they have intended to discriminate. Now, if that same student sued the conference, you know, they might have a case there. Um, but if they sued the university, the university could then point to, well, the reason that this happened is because of conference rules on scheduling. So one of the more interesting cases related to this is the case there at the bottom of the slide, McCormick versus the school district of Mamaroneck. I think that's how you pronounce that. So uh, it comes from New York State. So several New York school districts move girls soccer to the spring while the boys continued to play in the fall. And that change of girls soccer to the spring was made in response to surveys that the girls preferred soccer to be in the spring so that they could play field hockey in the fall. That way they can continue to be two sport athletes more easily. 
The plaintiffs allege that the schedule costs girls scholarship opportunities and keeps them from the playoffs, which are held in the fall. So the many of the or the, the state athletic associations still hosted the playoffs in the fall, but several schools, despite that, went ahead and moved their their uh, girls' schedule to the spring. So the school said that the changes were made in response to preference of the athletes and that changing back to the fall would be problematic because of a lack of coaches, but also a lack of field space. In that case, the courts sided with the plaintiffs because it affected opportunities, so for scholarships and championships, even though the girls um, survey were surveyed and wanted to play in the spring, the court ordered them to move back to the fall because that change ultimately cost them opportunities, like I said, for uh, playoffs and scholarships, because most of the scouting for colleges was done in the fall. And so the, the uh, schools had to move their, their girls' scheduling back to the fall. And the reason I mention that is because I live down the street from our local high school's soccer field, and I noticed that the boys and the girls still play in different parts of the calendar year. And so I wondered, um, you know, I, I assume that wouldn't hold up to a legal challenge, but I just thought it was interesting that the, the two are separated. So I don't know that. It's just pure speculation on my part. Similarly, um, the Minnesota State High School uh, Hockey Tournament, so the girls' tournament uh, in the early 2000s was held at a newer but smaller facility. And so um, the, that facility couldn't hold as many fans. So the boys play at the Excel Center, which is where the, uh, the Minnesota Wild, the NHL team, played. So even though the girls' tournament drew 15,000 fans and the boys' tournament drew 120,000 fans over the, the length of the total tournament, the court... Uh, decided that the smaller facility in which the girls played could restrict growth, and so the girls ended up moving to the Excel Center so that they would be in the same facility as the boys, um, even though the crowds tend to be much, much smaller for the girls than the boys. Um, the University of Iowa recently got uh, had a lawsuit filed against it because of uh, inequality in their facilities and in their scheduling. So in January of 2018, the University of Iowa signed a voluntary resolution with the Office of Civil Rights. Um, so there was no evidence of direct gender discrimination, but there's evidence of disparities. So for example, the athletic department spent an average of $4,249 buying equipment for male students, but only $2,012 for their female counterparts. So investigators found that male athletes received better treatment. For example, the baseball team has a larger, nicer, and newer locker room than softball. Uh, football and men's basketball got to stay in hotels the night before the competitions when almost none of the female teams got to do that. Um, and so because of that, Iowa was changing or was required to change how they carried out um, their scheduling and, and um, hotel rooms and that kind of stuff. All right, so that's that. The next slide, we talked about this. So this all comes from that uh, Gwinnett County case that we talked about earlier, so with the deliberate indifference. So that's all related to that, plus we talked about sexual harassment in a previous chapter, so I'm going to skip this slide. And the last one I'm going to mention, uh, I've actually touched on this case previously, um, but there's a question about it on the quiz, so I should mention it. So in Stanley versus USC, that is uh, Marianne Stanley, who is the women's basketball coach at USC in the early 1990s. Um, she made significantly less than her male counterpart, whose name was George Raveling. Um, and so, I'm trying to see if I have the specific numbers here. Um, so Raveling made over $130,000, which I guess in the scheme of basketball coaches, especially these days, not that much. So the men's coach made $130,000. She was offered $96,000. So ultimately she sued USC, alleging that her lower pay was a violation of the Equal Pay Act of, 19, of 1963, um, that both of them had the same job. They were both college basketball coaches at the same institution, and despite that, she was paid substantially less. And so her argument was that the reason she was paid less is because she was a woman. Um, and so USC defended themselves successfully by pointing to Raveling's record, so the men's coach's record, that he... Um, had been a coach of the Olympic basketball team, that he had a master's degree when she didn't, that he'd written several books, that he spoke at coaching clinics, that he uh, had to do a bunch more marketing things than she did. So the, the university was able to show that the difference in pay was not because of gender, but because the jobs 
required different things. Um, there were more media engagement, more, more um, requirements of the male coach, and further, that he had different qualifications than she did. So if there's a question of violation of the Equal Pay Act, the key, the key issue is, is the female employee paid less because of her gender, or is there some sort of non-discriminatory reason that the employer can point to as to why she makes less money? Is there a difference in qualifications, difference in the actual job duties expected, those kinds of things. All right, and so that is the end of the uh, gender equity chapter. So next week we'll move on to intellectual property. So be sure to take the quiz on this one, and then we'll see you next week.